So welcome to the first lecture slash screencast for chemical kinetics. Um, it's a fairly simple thing to start with, what we're going to do. Uh, mostly it's revision if you've paid attention at either A level or maybe you watch Crash Course. Uh, so if you know your stuff and you paid attention to kinetics, this should hopefully not be news to you. But what we are going to cover are some very specific things that we'll come back to again and again and again throughout the course. For a start, we're going to look at what is a chemical reaction. You might know that, uh, but we're going to look at some very specific parts of what the definition of a chemical reaction is that we are going to need. Then we're going to review some basic concepts of kinetics uh, and then look at what factors affect the rate of reaction. Now, the reason that we're doing it in this order is that we're going to build on what a reaction is. Uh, from an atomic level, from what a molecule is, with collision theory and so on, and then how the factors affect this. So we're actually really going to build upon previous things. Now, if you watch that introduction video on John Stone's Triangle, if you haven't, um, go watch it. It's a really interesting uh, subject. You realise that we're going to be mostly working in this whole submicroscopic realm of chemistry, the world of atoms and molecules and really small things, as opposed to the macroscopic world. But we'll do a little bit of maths and symbolic stuff um, soon. Uh, if this means nothing to you, maybe go look up John Stone's Triangle or watch that intro video. Um, this is just to try and help you know, orientate us. What are we going to be looking at? We're going to be looking at it entirely from the molecules perspective. So what is a chemical reaction? We have a vague idea of what a chemical reaction is, uh, but from the microscopic perspective, from what that means, it's a collision. It is literally molecules thumping into each other and forming a reaction. Now they've got to hit with the right orientation and speed, as we'll see in a moment, but it is a collision between chemical entities. And the chemical reaction part of it comes from a rearrangement. So that rearrangement has got to be Kind of, kind of important, especially because if we rearrange the atoms around, we can, say, get a new bond formed. And that new carbon-oxygen bond can be seen, say, in infrared spectroscopy. It means we can monitor the progress of this reaction. Right, we need the right orientation. Now, as chemists who work, we do a lot of stuff on paper. We often forget that molecules are actual entities that have to hit each other. We just write things down like this and then forget about it. But in reality, they've got to collide with the right orientation as well. They are physical objects. So if they bounce around in the wrong place, it doesn't matter if they've got the right energy. It doesn't matter how fast they're going or whether they do collide. A reaction won't happen. It's got to be the right orientation. This H side of the hydroxide, for instance, can't do anything to the Cl. It must entirely happen from the side of the molecule. So this is known as steric uh, factors. So if you have not looked this word up before, sterics, uh, do look it up. It is all about molecules getting in the way of each other purely because of their size. Um, don't worry if you don't know it. I went six months as an undergraduate without knowing this word, uh, and then it had to be cleared up in the tutorial. It was quite awkward. Anyway, so we need the right energy. So if there is a collision, and it is in the right place, it's not always going to actually happen. So if the molecule comes along with quite a lazy pace and they just tap each other, there's not going to be a reaction. Now the reason for this is fairly straightforward. If you think of what an atom is, it's got the nucleus in the middle, and then it's got this negative field of electrons. Now another atom over here, that's also electrons everywhere. They're negatively charged with obviously a positively charged nucleus to balance it out. But that's going to be a repelling force. Atoms, by and large, want to force themselves away from each other because the clouds of electrons repel. And if they're repelling, they're going to require some energy to overcome that repulsion and get close enough together so that the attraction between electrons and nuclei actually form a bond properly. So if you can't hop over that energy barrier, there's not going to be a reaction. So from a mi microscopic perspective, a chemical reaction is a collision between one, sometimes more molecules. It's got to be in the right orientation and it's got to have a certain energy associated with it. So how does this all apply to kinetics? Uh, we're going to look at concentration. Uh, this is very specific for kinetics. We always work in concentrations. We're going to look at rate constants, then reaction orders, and then finally the kind of the, the complex one, molecularity. And we'll do quite a bit on this later. So 
Concentration. Concentration is an amount per volume. This is far more useful to us in kinetics, especially than it is a, um, an amount. We don't just want one mole of a substance or we don't want one gram of a substance, for instance. We want a specific concentration because that is what we are interested in. Uh, now, it's perfectly valid to measure concentration in mass or weight. Um, sometimes you see the word specific written down. Uh, so if you see a term that is specific, uh, that's what it's called. It usually means it's measured in mass and grams rather than moles. Uh, or we do it in moles per volume. And then moles refer to discrete chemical entities. So in this case, in this box, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 very discrete chemical entities, 10 hydrogen uh, molecules. In this one, we have one. So this is 10 moles per the box. Uh, this has one mole per the box, but this is neon here. And that is 20 grams, uh, 20 moles, uh, 20 grams per mole, sorry. So both of these boxes would weigh the same, even though there are a different number of moles. So they would react very differently, even though they carried the same mass. So as chemists working in kinetics, we are only really interested in moles per volume. We'd never really want to work in mass or weight. We're not interested in that. We want definitely moles per volume. So reaction orders. If you've done a bit of chemical kinetics before, you'll know that rate, that is the speed of the reaction, uh, is defined by a rate constant K multiplied by two concentrations. So a reaction order is its dependency on concentration. So a rate is proportional so that's the proportional symbol, if you've never come across it before, uh, to concentration. But is it concentration raised to a certain power? Uh, so for instance, if it's directly proportional, it's concentration basically raised to the power one. If it's, it could actually be proportional to the concentration squared, for instance. And this is what we mean by first, second, or third order. So in this reaction, we've got two things coming together to collide together, and their rate law is k times two concentrations. Now we don't usually draw the little one in the corner, cause just leave it implied, but it's there. Um, if you have x and x squared or x cubed and so on, uh, that x there has a one in it that's just implied. So if we add these together, one plus one, that's two. It is second order over all. It works to the square of two concentrations. So if this was a bimolecular reaction between two things, it would be the equivalent of being proportional to the concentration squared. So proportional. Uh, and individually, it's first order. So with respect to an individual reactant, it is first order for both cases. So first order with respect to the chloromethane and the hydroxide in there. Uh, in this case, things look a bit different. So we've actually got two plus one here. That's three, so it is third order overall. This is then on fluorine interaction. Uh, and first order with respect to fluorine and second order with respect to xenon. Now you might have noticed something a bit funny about that uh, rate equation there. For a start, this reaction is xenon plus three F2. It goes to xenon hexafluoride, uh, if you care. And you'll notice that there's a three here and a sort of an implied one there. So why is the one next to fluorine and the two next to xenon? Well, there's simply because this rate doesn't necessarily reflect this reaction. The stoichiometry of the reaction can't predict what the rate actually is. Only in the very simplest, most elementary of cases does it have anything to do with it. So. This can only be determined by experiment. We have to run the reaction, change the concentration of xenon, change the concentration of fluorine, and see what happens. When the rate doubles, when we double a concentration, it means it's first order, so we'd stick a one there, for instance. So we can only get this experimentally. It has nothing to do with the stoichiometry. It does give some hints to the reaction, though, because it means if the reaction order is like that, it means you know, it's second order with respect to xenon. A really simple, straightforward reaction like a dentition that stepwise is probably not what's going on. Something else is going to be going on in there instead. 
so there are a few hints it gets a bit complicated uh, but it does hint at what could possibly happen in the reaction mechanism if we look at the reaction order and think a bit carefully about it so rate constant this is the other part of that rate equation k now this k is effectively just a factor that converts the two concentrations to a speed we know that rate is proportional to the concentration we just don't know how much so k covers that and k is unique to a particular reaction uh, for a particular temperature so if we ran this reaction with chloromethane and OH repeatedly with different concentrations of the two reactants uh, we would always get the same k we would calculate it out if we change the temperature k might go up or down but K, K is generally completely independent of the concentration. So this value of K and that value of K are not going to be the same number. They are going to be different and unique and representative of that reaction entirely. Uh, in fact, in these cases, uh, because one is second order and the other is third, that value of K will have different units. So I will do that as a curly K just to emphasize that it's small. So they're going to have different units, they're not going to be directly comparable, uh, but they will be unique and characteristic of that reaction. So how many molecules take part in the elementary reaction? Okay. This has a tendency of causing a little bit of confusion amongst people. So we're going to take this quite slowly. Uh, now if we define a rate of something, uh, we write it like this, so DOH. That's a concentration change with respect to time. So we'll cover a bit of the maths about what that means later, but for now, this just means rate. This is our definition of rate. It is a differential equation. Um, and if one molecule of OH is disappearing here, one molecule of chlor chloromethane is also disappearing. So the rate of change of that, CH3Cl by DT, are both equal. They are equal. When one of this disappears, one of this disappears. And then at the same time, one of these appears as well. So that's equal to, well, I'll make the pluses explicit, the change in the methanol DT, and also equal to the change positive of Cl DT. So those are all equal. It's very straightforward. One disappears, one reappears. All the rates of change are the same. Uh, this second reaction, oxygen plus hydrogen, slightly different because when, well, well, we'll do the simple one first. Two of these disappear, two hydrogen molecules disappear, two water ones appear in the reaction. So that's you come to saying one goes away and another appears in the reaction. So DH2 by DT is equal to DH2O by DT. So those rates are exactly the same. What about oxygen? What is that equal to? It's obviously not going to be equal to, sorry, I will make sure I keep my negatives in here, uh, H2 by DT. It is not going to be equal. So we have to think about what are we going to measure this as. Now, people get confused by this. They wonder, do we have to multiply by a stoichiometry? Do we have to divide by it? The way to do this is to just look at the reaction, think about what's going on, take it slowly, and kind of say it out loud what's happening. So what's happening is when one of these disappears, two of these disappear with it. So if oxygen's concentration must go down by one mole, then the concentration of hydrogen must go down by two moles. So hydrogen is disappearing at twice the rate. Twice the rate of O2. How do we represent that mathematically? Well, we can therefore put A times 2 here. So double the rate of oxygen, we get the same rate as the change in hydrogen. Or we can bring that two to the other side and say it's times by a half. <clears throat> the same, these are two ways of expressing the exact same thing. The rates of individual change uh, remain the same. What we're changing is how we're relating them by a little multiplication factor. So say it out loud, this disappears 
at half the rate of this, or this is at twice the rate of that. This is how you represent it mathematically. So if I complete the pattern here, the plus H2O must be at the same rate as hydrogen, so that is also times by half. So whether they are threes or twos or anything around here, we'll cover a couple of more examples a bit later, but you have to remember that these rates are related by fractions on occasion if the stoichiometry isn't one to one to one. Here it's one to one to one to one. It's really easy. So that is the summary of what we're going to be doing, basic concepts of kinetics. So now we're going to cover how do we influence the rate of reaction from the perspective of a molecule. Well, firstly, concentration. This is effectively just a probability argument. You can see here these, these molecules, for instance, they could wander around this box for a while and they can keep glazing around and then suddenly they hit and have a collision. These ones, well, they're a bit, oh, now it's collided here. It can go, up. now it's collided here. We can go around around, oh, it's collided again. You can see that as something is becomes more concentrated, uh, and this is concentration, it's per amount, uh, per volume, not an absolute amount, um, as something becomes more uh, concentrated, the odds of a collision happening increase. You still have to have the right energy and the right orientation, of course, but if you've got more collisions, the odds of having a successful collision increase by default. So we also have speed. So this is why you, um, when we're looking at, um, from the molecules perspective, what determines whether it can have a successful collision. It's got to be able to hop that energy barrier in order to have a chemical reaction. So where does it get that energy from? Well, literally at the microscopic level, it is the physical speed of the molecules. So these ones are going around quite lazily, quite slowly. These ones are zipping around with a lot of speed. If they collide with each other, the odds of a successful collision are much higher. These ones are more likely just to slap off each other because they're going much more slowly. So we represent this kind of graphically with something called an activation energy. Uh, so if we have a graph here and energy goes up, so that's energy. This is the activation energy, EA. Uh, sometimes it's um, delta G or delta H, depending on how you want to define it. With this little double dagger on top saying that it's a distance to a transition state. Uh, that is different to the things you get from thermodynamics, for instance, which would be an equilibrium based idea. So something that has a lot of speed and a lot of energy, has enough energy top straight over here. Something that has a little bit of speed will just lazily get up a certain way and then fall back down to reactants again. Uh, so that's from a micros microscopic perspective. In the lab, that manifests as temperature. So when we come to do the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, we will get a more concrete idea of what the relationship between the speed of a molecule and temperature is. Uh, but until now, you just need to know that temperature that we feel in the lab translates into the molecules moving faster. Therefore, they collide with more energy. They can hop over an activation barrier and react more efficiently. Now, size and complexity. I said that chemists have a tendency to forget that molecules are physical things that interact and move. So look at this uh, reaction, for instance. This Cl has to attach to a delta positive carbon. Now, whether that reaction goes ahead or not is <clears throat> something that you can ask organic chemists about. We're just interested in the steric factors here. So that's that word again, sterics. Um, let's have a look at this carbon, hence why I've drawn them as spheres rather than as abstract diagrams. Uh, well. CL can't get at this side of the carbon because the oxygen's in the way, so that's pretty much out of the question. Uh, can't get at this side of the carbon because there is another carbon atom in the way. Uh, it probably can't get at that side because there is another carbon atom in the way. Uh, and side on probably won't do much. So you can see there's a very tiny slither of this back sphere that the CL can actually hit. So if you work that out, that's probably less than 10% of the area of that sphere. So Think about it, one in 10 times, this CL just hits it randomly from any direction. One in 10 times, it 
can't do anything no matter what, no matter how much energy it's got or how fast it's going, it's not going to create a successful reaction. It has to hit it in the right way, not the wrong way. So all else being equal, that's going to be quite a slow reaction. Now compare to this faster one here. Cl, well, I'll draw it out, Cl radical plus O2. This is the kind of thing you might see in the upper atmosphere. It's sort of a gas phase reaction and it goes quite quick. Partially because Cl is completely spherically symmetrical. Uh, look at it, you can attack it from any end. It doesn't really care, it can take it anywhere. Um, oxygen, meanwhile, well, if it needs to attack end on, it's got that entire half that the Cl can attack. It's got this entire half that it can attack and to be honest it can probably come from the sides or in the middle as well anything so i wouldn't be surprised if this reaction could go ahead no matter what end the collision was so there is very little restriction in terms of orientation for this reaction to go ahead so all else being equal that kind of reaction will go very quick uh, this kind of reaction will go very slowly so Let's review. If you were paying attention, we learned that what is a chemical reaction? Well, at the microscopic level, the molecular world, it is a collision between molecules. It also requires energy, and that energy is carried by speed of molecules. Then when we looked into kinetics, we found that the reaction order says that the rate is proportional to a concentration. And then we found that a rate constant is basically turns that proportional sign into a K. And then we looked briefly at molecularity, knowing that one rate is not necessarily equal to another rate. You have to take into account the fact that more than one thing can be reacting at once. So factors that influence the rate of reaction from the atom's perspective and the molecule's perspective, then concentration. That's a probability argument. The more concentrated things are, the higher the probability of a collision. And then speed, which at the lab scale, the macroscopic world, uh, manifests as temperature. So the faster they're moving, the hotter they are, the higher the chance of an actual successful collision. And then size and complexity. So simple molecules that don't really care about their orientation are gonna react quite nippily and quite quick. Molecules that have a lot of bulk and steric hindrance around them to try and protect these areas, they're going to move quite slowly. So that's it for kinetics, the very first screencast lecture. Uh, this is just basic concepts revision that you need to know before we move on because we're going to study all this in a little bit more detail. And in the lectures, we're going to do a bit more interactive work and a bit more... Okay interesting data processing as well. We're going to try and take these points, turn them into problems and then solve those problems. So I will see you there.